stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, today we are doing, as we do every day, a program for non-Catholics. That's right. Uh, it's a Catholic network, and yet here we are doing a show for non-Catholics. If you've got a question about the Catholic faith, maybe you're looking around to get an answer for that question, we can assist you with that. If you're listening today on radio or online, here's our live phone number, 833 833- 288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. If you're watching us on TV today, here's how you can contact the show. Our email address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at EWTN.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Jeff Burson handles social media for us. If you want to ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, we are streaming there right now on both of those platforms. Just put your question in the comments box. Jeff will see that. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio, and hopefully we can get your question answered on today's program. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Tom, Andrews. Tom, how are you today? You know what? I'm doing great. How about you, sir? I'm doing decent. Thank you. Interesting objection we received here from Nathan, objection to the Catholic faith, that is. Nathan says, how would you answer the Protestant view that when Jesus asks for the cup to be taken from him, this is the cup of God's wrath, a metaphor for punishment of the sinful in Isaiah 51. This seemingly backs up their view of the atonement. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So first of all, let me give a little background context for listeners who may be going, Huh? What? Right? So we, it's often a topic of conversation on this show. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? Yeah, yeah. And, and Catholics have a different answer to that question from at least some Protestant groups. And in the mind of many Protestants, the reason Jesus died was that God was wrathful for, for, at humanity and needed to expiate his wrath upon a subject. Sort of like you got to get it out of your system, mm. so to speak. Right? Okay, all right. And that Christ steps in to be punished by God in place of us, a vicarious punishment. And then in turn, God acquits us, acquits us he imputes Jesus' righteous life to us, and imputes our sin to him so that we kind of get off scot-free. And that undergirds the Protestant idea of salvation by faith alone. If all the punishment for sin has already been inflicted on Jesus, there's really nothing left to be punished, and so he can forgive us scot-free and let us into heaven. Okay, That's kind of the Protestant view. The Catholic view is quite different from that. For a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that implicates God in punishing innocent people and acquitting guilty people, and that's kind of what we call injustice, right? Yeah. So that's that's the other reason that Catholics don't believe it is it's not what Scripture says, it's not what tradition says about the meaning of the death of Christ. So Saint Paul describes the death of Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. He's drawing the language from the Old Testament sacrificial system. And if you study the Old Testament sacrifices, you see right off that one thing that was not going on was substitutionary punishment. Israelites did not bring animals to the temple so that God could expiate his wrath on them. Rather, they brought animals to the temple as, a, as an offering uh, to, to give up something of value to God in reparation for sin or in thanksgiving or whatever their purpose was. The idea was, I offer you something valuable in token of reparation, thanksgiving, reconciliation, you name it, whatever the purpose was. And that's the way Scripture looks at the death of Christ, that Jesus gave up something of value, namely his own human life, and subjected himself to the ill treatment of evil men, right, who put him to death unjustly. That's what we call a martyrdom. Mm -hmm. And that Christ's offering was therefore pleasing to God because it was virtuous, it was meritorious. And so the, the whole dynamism of the relationship between father and son is construed very differently in the Catholic view from the Protestant view. Now, this fellow wants to say, hey, Jesus asked that the cup be taken away from him. Doesn't that suggest that um, uh, that the Protestant view is really correct and that this was an outpouring of God's wrath? Nope, because that's <laughs> not what the text says. Yeah. A, that, that's reading something into the text that's not there. There's absolutely nothing in the prayer of Christ that suggests that Jesus views this as, as God's wrath and punishment inflict upon him personally. 
Okay, mm -hmm. very good. And we have this question here from uh, Aaron, who says, you have previously mentioned or recommended, rather, the book Luther, Man Between God and the Devil, as a good biography that places Luther in his historical context. I was wondering if you could recommend a book that does the same for John Calvin. Yes, uh, Alexandre Ganoche, and that's how you pronounce it, but it doesn't look anything like that. It's G-A-N-O-C-Z-Y, I think. It looks like Ganotsky, but it's pronounced Ganoche. And uh -huh. he was a Hungarian French Catholic priest uh, who was an ecumenical Reformation scholar, and he 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 uh, uh, wrote a biography of Calvin called The Young Calvin, right? That's very good. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a really short work um, by Obermann, who's the same man that wrote Luther, Man Between God and the Devil. Uh, I think it's called Initia Calvini, right? It's a Latin title, uh -huh. uh, but you can find it. Uh, it's okay. It's short. It deals with sort of a narrow set of questions. Um, uh, Protestant scholar Alistair McGrath has a passable biography of Calvin um, that is uh, largely dependent on secondary literature, uh, but um, but it's okay, yeah. So those are, those are some to go yeah. on. Um, a fellow by the name of Bausma has a pretty well-respected Calvin biography. So, I mean, there's a lot of them out there, but um, okay. but uh, I like uh, Ganoche's The Young Calvin, or Le Jeune Calvin, if you want the French title. Some great resources for, uh, resources for you there, Aaron. And uh, this one from Jack. Why are Catholics made to go to church every Sunday? Right. So, interestingly... The obligation to go to mass, like that was articulated in law, uh, was that was not the case for most of the church's history. There wasn't a universal law in canon in the code of canon law saying mm. all Catholics have to go to mass on mm -hmm. Sunday. Um, they didn't need one because all Catholics went to mass on Sunday. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, maybe not literally, but but the idea was this is the feast of Christ's resurrection. It's central to Catholic identity, and it's the first liturgical feast recognized and celebrated in the Christian church, right? The idea that we're going to gather on the first day of the week to celebrate mm -hmm. what God has done for us as a public community is integral to Christian identity. And I think the reason that the church implemented the obligation in law was in the modern period with secularization taking hold and people falling away from the faith, the church felt like it was incumbent upon the magisterium to emphasize to the faithful that, yeah, this is a really important part of our identity. I guess it's all in how you look at it. Do you think, oh, I have to go to Mass, or wow, I get to go to Mass. Exactly. That's where we need to be. We're going to get to the phones in just a moment here. You can call in as well at 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986 for Call to Communion. It's called a communion here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. Beginning today with Mike in Albany, New York, listening on the great Pox at Bonham Radio, a longtime partner with EWTN. Hello, Mike. What's on your mind today? Hey, um, I... Mike, are you still there? Uh, we just lost Mike. We'll hopefully get him back on the program. Here's an email now uh, from Cindy who says, does the Catholic Church definitively teach that Mary did not have labor pains whatsoever when giving birth to Jesus? Is it required to believe that she did not have labor pains? I believe that she was always a virgin, but I do not see why having labor pains negates the fact that she was still a virgin, even with the explanations and reasoning given by popular apologists. What do you think? Right. So the church's doctrine on Mary's perpetual virginity uh, means more than simply that she didn't have sexual relations with a man. It also means that the, the integrity of her body uh -huh. remained intact um, after the birth of Christ. And as you know, if you've ever witnessed a birth or or, or given birth, uh, giving birth changes things in your body. Oh yeah, right. And and that didn't wasn't the case with the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the the conclusion of painlessness is really an inference from, well, it had to be a miraculous birth, not just a miraculous conception, in order for that to be the case. Okay, very good. And uh, Cindy, thanks so much for your email. Here's one now from Gary. And this really gets to the heart of the matter. How can we be certain that God exists? And why are atheists so adamant in declaring that there is no God? 
Right, thanks. I appreciate the question. So certainty about the existence of God, we have to be real clear what we're saying. We can't have philosophical certainty. We can't have a certainty from reason alone that the God of the Bible specifically exists. I'll mm. get to that question in a minute. What we, what we make philosophical arguments about are that there is an immaterial first cause of the universe. Right. And, and uh, there are multiple philosophical arguments that have as a conclusion that something that answers to the description God exists, namely something that is itself without cause, uh, without extension in space, you know, spiritual, uh, powerful, metaphysically simple, that, th these kinds of attributes of divinity um, are, are stand at the, at the headwaters of the explanation for why there's something rather than nothing. Those are the kind of arguments that we can form. Mm -hmm. What can you say about that that all-powerful, invisible, eternal, spiritual entity? Well, apart from those negations, very little, mm. right? And, and the Catholic faith teaches that naturally we can know very little about the inner nature of God in his essence. That's where revelation comes in. So things like the doctrine of the Trinity or the incarnation of Christ or God's intervention in the, 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 the history of the people of Israel, that, that's not stuff we can know with certainty from philosophy. We learn that from the data of Revelation. All right. And uh, Gary, thanks so much for your email. We have reestablished uh, contact here with Mike in Albany. Hey, Mike, thanks for calling back. Uh, what's going on today? <laughs> Very good. I don't know what happened. Uh, I was trying to see if Dr. Anders had a good source to help refute Protestants when they get into the whole uh, St. John's Gospel that uh, Jesus was a God. And I've looked on uh, Google, and I can't find a very good source to, to help me explain the original Greek. Oh, okay. So, uh, well, I mean, uh, I, was, I thought you were going to ask me where in the Scripture can I, can I find arguments for the full divinity of Jesus, and I was going, ah, he, he doesn't know the Gospel of John. I'm going to give him the Gospel <laughs> of John. But obviously you do know the Gospel of John and yeah. the passage in there, before Abraham was born, I am, I and the Father are one. The Word was, uh, in the beginning, words with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. No, th these are the texts from the Gospel of John that are the strongest on the question of Christ's divinity. Now, in terms of developing that into an articulate doctrine of the, of the Trinity, I mean, probably no better source than the fathers of the Church who, who made these arguments. And so Athanasius' is On the Incarnation, for example, would be a seminal text in that, in that theological development. Um, you know, good good Catholic commentaries on the Gospel of John will also detail that. So St. Thomas Aquinas's commentary on the Gospel of John, for huh. example, is quite lengthy, mm. uh, but it's also available online in the public domain, so you don't have to buy it. Uh, would be another one. Uh, and there, you know, modern anything from, say, like the Catholic commentary series, that sort of thing. So we'll engage those texts and talk about their meaning and the right way to exegete them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike, is that helpful for you, sir? Uh, uh, no, I just uh, sidetracked a little bit. It was the specific, uh, the very beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And their refutation keeps saying, no, 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 the Word was a God. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so that, that's a question about the, about the translation of Greek. Okay, now, I myself am not a Greek scholar. I, I did study Koine Greek way back in the seminary days. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of like you can learn enough karate to get beaten up. You know, I, I learned enough Greek to be dangerous to myself, you know, but uh, but I can give you in I won't get, I won't get it precisely right. OK, but I can give you in, in rough general terms the answer to your question um, in, in any language has us what we call a syntax and syntax is the order that words fall within a sentence. You know, in English, we often put the subject and then a verb and then an object. Mm -hmm. Other languages don't necessarily function that way. OK, um, Greek has a peculiarity about. When when word order is shifted in a certain way, um, it can it can trigger the presence or absence of a definite article. Right, the is the definite article. Okay, and there are times in Greek where the absence of the definite article indicates an indefinite article. So the proper translation would be a as opposed to the. All right, but because of the nature of Greek syntax, there are other times when because of a syntactical change, even without the expressed written article, the definite article is still implied. Now, that's what is going on in John's Gospel. And I've, I've forgotten the names of the rules because it's been 30 years since I took Greek, okay? But I remember the discussions. That's what's going on in John's Gospel. 
And so what happened, Russell, who was the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, he he was kind of like I am. He knew enough Greek to be dangerous, <laughs> enough karate to get beaten up, you know? Sure. So he, he, he learned some things about definite articles in Greek. He went to look at John's gospel, and he said, hey, there, we don't have the definite article. That means we have to translate this as a God rather than the God, okay? Um, now, how do you know that's really wrong? Well, apart from getting hold of a Greek grammar and actually studying it out, which you can do, I mean, mm. go get hold of a Greek grammar— um, the most viciously Trinitarian members of Christ faithful are the Greeks. I mean, go, go to Greece, yeah. <laughs> right? Ask them what what this means, and you will find. I mean, they are they are the most consistently aggressively Trinitarian Christians on the planet, right? The Greeks, and and uh, uh, and this is not you know the arguments in the fourth century about the divinity of Christ were not. Uh, they they had exegetical arguments. They had, they had exegesis of, uh, arguments about the meaning of biblical text. Uh-huh. This wasn't one of them. I mean, like they, they didn't get down into the question of the Greek article as to whether or not that indicated the God or a God. That that's a that's a very pedantic modern uh, American debate, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and and so you know Arius, for example, who who wanted to promote the idea that Christ was a God, he had metaphysical arguments from God's unicity, right? That God can't be one and there be two persons, mm-hmm. right? But they weren't, it, it, it wasn't grounded in this kind of pedantic uh, exegetical concern. And and anybody who's spent any time at all with Greek grammar knows that that's not an issue. Okay. Hey, Mike, we hope that's helpful for you. Thanks so much for your call. Glad that you uh, called back. And uh, that opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833 833- 288-3986. If you're watching us on TV today, do shoot us an email. The address is ctc at ewtn.com. Let's go to uh, Brian now in Charlottesville, Virginia, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Brian, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi there. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, my question is about the transfiguration. When Moses and Elijah appear, are they in their glorified bodies? Because I know... Elijah went up into heaven on the chariot, so I, it's almost like he was assumed into heaven. So I don't know if when he makes an appearance there, if it's going to be his glorified body. Okay. You know, that is a great question. And uh, I would love to know, actually, while we're talking, I'm sitting here pulling up Thomas's commentary <laughs> to see if I can see what Thomas had to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the answer to this kind of question is, of course, entirely speculative. Right? We're just going to make our best guess because the text itself doesn't tell us. Mm. We're, we're raising questions that the text doesn't raise. Uh-huh. So let me give you what my intuition says. And, and look, I am not a father of the church. I'm not a pope. I'm not a bishop. I'm not a priest. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just a little old me. So you can take what I give you with a grain of salt and you throw it out. If you find some authority that says otherwise, then you go with them. Okay. But this is what it seems to me. Um, the, the resurrection of the body has not yet happened. Okay. Okay. So we are not talking about Moses and Elijah in resurrected bodies. We're not talking about them in resurrected bodies. And in the intermediate state, before the resurrection, Moses and Elijah are spirits. Right? They don't have their bodies. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in the same way that you can have what theologians would call an angelophany in the Old Testament, the angels are spirits. They don't have bodies either. But some, occasionally, God will permit humans to see something that they take to be an angel, and it is kind of a, a you know, a, a visible stand-in for what would otherwise be an invisible creature. Okay. Right? And so the angels will be depicted as having limbs and, you know, eating and that sort of thing. I do know what Thomas says about that. He says they're not really eating. They don't really have the full digestive machinery that we have because they don't need it, right? That this is a kind of condescension so that they are capable of interacting with human beings. And I think something probably similar is going on with apparitions of saints before the resurrection, that what we're seeing is not a, a, a physical, tangible, resurrected body, uh, because we understand that Christ has one of those, but the rest of us receive them only at the second coming, at the general judgment, at the resurrection of the dead. So this is something, I don't know if we could call it like a hagiophany, right? This is a kind of appearance of a saint uh-huh. that's been adapted for for uh, for human sensibility, but it's not the it's not the full blown resurrected body. That'd be my intuition. It's a fascinating uh, topic to ponder, isn't oh, it? Oh, lots though? of fun, lots of fun. To really ask is. Kind of questions. Brian, thanks so much uh, for checking in with us here on Call to Communion on EWTN. Our phone number eight three three. 
888-288-EWTN. We do have some lines open right now. 833-288-3986. Barry checks in with an email. I'm having trouble getting my head wrapped around intercession and how to venerate saints without thinking of them as more than I should. Any suggestions? Well, um, I don't know how how you should. I don't. When you say you can't help thinking of them as more than you should, I'm wondering what your conception is of what you should. Maybe overemphasizing? Well, yeah, yeah, but I'm trying to say, like, if he has some normative idea of, here's how I should think about saints, mm. and yet I find myself tempted to think something more, I'd like to know what those distinctions are, right? Yeah, because yeah. here's what is legitimate to think of saints. They are super, mega, awesome, cool, right? They're vastly holy. Uh, they're, they enjoy the beatific vision uh, that God... Uh, condescends to afford tremendous benefits to mm. their prayers and intercessions. I mm-hmm. mean, like, uh, you know, I mean, it's okay to think higher of saints than you would say of Taylor Swift, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, pick pick your most celebrated celebrity in sure. all the fanfare you can imagine, and it's permissible to think even greater accolades regarding the saints, Right now, you can't ascribe to them all the attributes of divinity. They're not omniscient. They're not omnipotent. Uh, they're not omnipresent. They're not eternal. They don't have mm. any of those things. And yet, God is those things, mm-hmm. and God could choose to exercise His omnipotence through the intercession of a particular saint for a particular concrete purpose. Right. So, yeah, yeah. anything you can ask God in prayer, you could ask it through the intercession of a saint. And we're not we're not saying that the saint is the person that's giving the answer the saint is just asking along with us god's the one's giving the answer but he can but he can choose to utilize the saint's intercession to that end but in terms of how 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 exalted can you think of a saint i mean pretty darn exalted yeah pretty darn exalted because I mean, if they are if they're in heaven they're enjoying the presence of god they're confirmed in holiness i mean eye hasn't seen ear hadn't heard hadn't entered into the heart of man what god has in store for those who love him it could be some pretty awesome stuff mm-hmm. we just watched for probably the umpteenth time, A Man for All Seasons, the wonderful movie all about uh, St. Thomas More and his final days. And and I get something new out of that movie every time I've seen it after all these years. Yes, yes, that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Here's a quick question now from Ray in Fort Worth. Love your show. This may not be in your wheelhouse, but do you know what the selection process is for diocesan bishops? Um, yes, yeah, so there's actually a dicastery that's an office in the Vatican. Uh, it's, the, it's the dicastery for bishops that uh-huh. is responsible for making suggestions to the Holy Father about who, who should be named a bishop. And, um, you know, there's a, you know, in any particular region like the United States, for example, there, there will be a, a network of people who advise the dicastery. And you know some voices that are listened to more than others, and <laughs> and uh, and and it is a it is very much a you know a backroom uh, kind of operation. I mean, it is it is intentionally not evident to the faithful, you know. Yeah. And, and and is they're hard to handicap. I'll tell you that. You know, when we, we were when you get when you get a new bishop, a lot of times there's surprises. You know. Oh it, yeah. You know, people always come up with their short list of who we think the candidates could be, and then. Strange how they never turn out to be those candidates. It's ultimately up to the to the Pope, oh, right? Up to the Pope, exactly. So, so a list is submitted to the Pope, maybe three names or however many it is, and then the Pope says, "It's it's going to be this man or uh, go back and give me three more or something like that," right? Yeah. Now, actually, while we we're talking, do you remember Tom? We got a question a few minutes ago about what is it that the disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration when yes. Moses and Elijah appeared? Yes. And I said, I would, I would love to know what St. Thomas said. Uh-huh. While we've been talking, I've been doing double duty. I've got I my eye it. on Thomas's commentary. Yeah. I found it. I found it. So I said that it's probably analogous to an angelophany. All right. Thomas says, one should say that they were seen just as the angels were seen. You nailed it. So I got the Thomistic answer. I got it. Look at you. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for joining us here on Call to Communion on EWTN. Lines are open right now. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986. Back in just a moment. It's called to Communion here on EWTN. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, looks like we have three lines open. What a great time to call 
288-3986. If you're watching us on TV today, that is uh, going to be delayed a little bit. So your best bet is to shoot us an email, ctc at EWTN.com. Hey, congratulations going out to another member of the EWTN family, Iowa Catholic Radio, celebrating 17 years with us, now serving Iowa with five AM and FM stations there in the state. Congratulations to Joe Teeling, Matt Wilcom, and everybody at Iowa Catholic Radio. Very important, a longtime member of the EWTN family. All right, back to the phones now for Rod in Lafayette, Louisiana, listening on the great Christ Our King Radio. Hey, Rod, what's on your mind today, sir? Yes, I have a question that, that when we go to confession, all our senses resolve, dissolve, or go away like, like smoke in the air. And I, I heard something on radio, and I can't remember which doctor it was. It was on EWTN. And he said at the second coming, everything we've done good and everything we've done bad, it's gonna, we're going to have to stand and say it, or it's going to show up on a billboard with our name or something like that. And I, I just I don't understand that. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So, so it is true. Christ said that at the second coming, that uh, you know what has been whispered in in houses will be shouted from rooftops, and what's done in secret will be revealed. Um, but it's also true that that when we repent and are forgiven, that God, and this is the language of Scripture, places His sins as far away from us as the east is from the west. So, how do we reconcile these two things? Well, the final judgment, when all will be revealed, will reveal sins, but it'll also res- it will also reveal virtues and merits. Mm. And so for, for those who have been reconciled to God, um, it will largely be, a, you know, a big attaboy fest, right? <laughs> that, that Jesus, is, his verdict is well done, good and faithful servant. And so you, you shouldn't think about the last judgment, for, you should not think, as if uh, this were a kind of celestial accounting when God goes back over the books again and weighs your good deeds and your bad deeds. That's, mm. that's not how it's going to happen. Um, if you're forgiven, then you're forgiven, and that, that's, that's over and done with, and that doesn't get brought up again. Um, but, uh, but your righteous deeds will be remembered. Now, obviously, for any person, I mean, it's possible to be forgiven today and sin tomorrow, right? Well, you, you still have to deal with that sin tomorrow when it comes up. It's not one act of forgiveness doesn't clear you for your entire life into mm. the future, you know. Um, and uh, there's something that we call venial sins, which are maybe you know, more trivial matters that we haven't really dealt with. And so it's possible for somebody to be vindicated by Christ. That Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. But they, they still have a little cleaning up to do around the edges. That's possible, too. Right? Sure. So th- those are the way, that's the way to think about it. Now, of We're, course, if you're not reconciled to God and you haven't repented, then it's just going to be kind of a litany of uh, bad stuff. Mm. Rod, is that helpful for you, sir? Yeah, but I still don't understand completely. But. Oh, well, wh- where, where are you hung up? I mean, the, the idea is, let's say, just take this at random, okay? I'm not accusing you of anything. Let's say uh, Rod or you or me or Tom, one of us has committed murder. Well, God forbid one of us would ever do that, but let's say somebody murdered. And, uh, and you go to confession. You say, you know, Lord, I'm sorry for murdering. And you get absolved. And the priest absolves you, and that's done. You're reconciled to God. You do your penance, and the murder's in the back, uh, in the background. On the last day, God is not going to say, hey, remember that murder. It's not going to come up again. All right? It's not going to come up again. Unconfessed sin will come up. Confessed sin that's forgiven will not come up. Unconfessed sin, it'll come up. Okay. Does that do it for you there, Rod? So you unconfessed sin. So my my, my thoughts are right that with, when you go to confession, the sins of or, or just disappear. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. What when, when you go to confession, if you make a good confession, everything you've done wrong up to that point in your life is poof gone. Okay. Appreciate your call there, Rod. Thanks for checking in from Lafayette. Call to communion here on EWTN. Still time for your call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Let's go to uh, Fairfax, Virginia now and go uh, talking with Brett, a first-time caller listening on the great Guadalupe radio serving uh, Virginia there and also Maryland, D.C., fantastic radio station. Now, Brett, what's on your mind today, sir? Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I had a question. It says at the end Jesus will come back to judge the living and the dead. And I know that Elijah and Mary went straight up to heaven. So I'm wondering for everybody else, 
do you stay here on earth or where do you go in between the judgment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there, there are three possibilities. Three possibilities. There are some, like the Blessed Virgin and Elijah, that go immediately into the presence of God. Uh, there are others that go to hell, that are immediately separated from the presence of God in a definitive way that's permanent. Um, there are others who are saved, who have the grace of God in their souls, um, who, who live in hope, but who are not admitted to the full glory of the vision of God uh, and have some cleaning up to do. And they go to what we call purgatory. It's an intermediate state. That's, it's, think of it as like the antechamber to heaven, or maybe like the, it's the front step where you, clean, where you clean your feet. You know, it's, you're on your the way to room. heaven. <laughs> the mud room. You're on your way to, to heaven, but you're not quite there yet. Mm. And you have, we call it doing penance. You have to do penance for some sins that were un, not dealt with in this life. Uh, but those souls are not miserable, right? They, they live in hope of, of the vision of God, and they will absolutely get there. Uh, but they weren't they weren't admitted immediately. So those are your three options. You can go straight to heaven, you can go to hell, you can go to the intermediate state called purgatory, and then at the second coming, uh, Jesus will publicly judge the living and the dead, and everybody gets a body back. So you don't you don't you don't finish out eternity as a, as a disembodied spirit. You finish out eternity as an embodied soul. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, Brett, thanks so much for your call today from Fairfax, Virginia. Call to communion here on EWTN. Steve is in Illinois. He's listening on the great WSFI and says, Dr. Andrews, does one have to be in the state of grace to make a spiritual communion? Yeah, thanks. So you don't have to be in the state of grace to form the intention that you would like to be united with God in charity, right? To have God come and dwell in your soul. If you're not in the state of grace, and you have that intention, that, that's probably a pretty, pretty good place from which to make an act of contrition, mm. right? So you would say, God, I'm, I'm not in a good way. I'm, I'm sinning. I'm sinning against you, against my conscience. Mm. And I would like to be reconciled to you and come and have you live in my soul. I am really sorry. Please come live in my soul. Well, in that case, the, the act of reaching out to God for spiritual communion would be a piece with, be the flip side of that act of contrition, Right. What we can say with certainty is that the soul who is who is in mortal sin and is not reconciled to God, who does not make an effort to be reconciled to God, by definition cannot commune with God. Right? If I if I have enmity, if I'm at enmity with God in my heart, mm -hmm. I cannot simultaneously be in communion with God in my heart. It's impossible. Sure. Right? Um, and so the only way I can be in spiritual communion with God, whether that is focused by an intense love for the Eucharist or in some other way, is to have the dis make the decision to be reconciled to him, and that requires contrition on my part. Okay. Steve, thanks for listening to WSFI, a very important partner of us in the uh, Chicago area. Called to communion here on EWTN, Brendan watching us on YouTube today. Brendan says, how would you tell your three-year-old about why your family is Catholic? And then how we should think about or treat those who are not Catholic. Oh, yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So how would I tell a three-year-old about why we're Catholic? Well, I, I think I would, I would focus in on the person of Jesus, right? That okay. Jesus is God's son, that he, he loves us, uh, that he tells us how to live our lives, and we love Jesus and we want to be his disciples, and, uh, and that's the best way to be in, in fellowship with Jesus. And the Catholic Church is the family of people who love Jesus and want to follow him. Um, there are other people who don't know Jesus, or maybe they don't know everything that we know about Jesus. Uh, but they can be good people, and they are joined to us like insofar as they are open to the truth and seek the good, even if they know Jesus or not personally, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't ever want my child to, I want my child to think that it is objectively good to be a Catholic and it's the appropriate stance to have in life mm -hmm. without ever thinking that they are better than someone else just in virtue of being Catholic, uh, okay. right? Because there are, there are non-Catholic people who are better human beings than I am. And I fully recognize that and I see that as the presence of grace in their life mm -hmm. granted to them in some unseen way that mm -hmm. is known to God and not to me, right? Um, and I, 
I, w I want to have their virtues. I want to see them as people that I should imitate. And I, I value them, and they're, you know, they're important. Uh, I'm not better than them, um, but I'm committed to following God in the person of Jesus Christ and the fullness of his self-revelation in the Catholic Church. Brendan, thanks so much for your question via YouTube today. It's called A Communion on EWTN. Let me tell you about something wonderful now available from EWTN's religious catalog, either for this year or perhaps for Christmas seasons to come. It is the 12 Days of Christmas ornament set. This beautifully boxed set includes a bell-shaped ornament for each of the 12 days of Christmas, each depicting the unique gift referenced in that popular Christmas carol for that day. You know the one I'm talking about. Uh, included with the set is a card that lists the items and offer, offers a corresponding alternative meaning for each of the numbered gifts. Now, this is a fun way to practice your catechism while decorating your Christmas tree each year. Each finely crafted metal ornament has a baked enamel silver finish, capturing the exceptional detail of each piece, making this set a true keepsake to cherish for generations. Each ornament, three inches high, comes with a red or green ribbon for hanging. It's available right now at EWTNRC.com. Buy Catholic, shop Catholic, EWTNRC.com. I'm going to buy one. Very good. This looks great. Called a communion here on EWTN. A question now, this is from uh, Dennis, who says, Dr. Anders, just recently a reading from the Book of Romans struck a chord with me about why the form of worship the church follows is so important. St. Paul is listing the gifts of the Jewish people, including the gift of worship. It makes perfect sense now because the, quote, form is in communion with the worship in his presence in heaven. Is this correct? As a Protestant convert, I wonder why so much detail to form. Um, yeah, thank you. So so I, I, I think what you just said yes. was that the form of worship prescribed in Scripture corresponds to heavenly realities. I think mm. that's what you just said. I, I believe I, the, so. The wording was a little bit different, right? Yeah. Um, well, that that's that's explicitly what the book of Hebrews teaches. Right, that is explicitly the argument of Hebrews. Now, there is, a, there is, I think, a naive way to understand that relationship, and then one that I think that's more useful. The, the, naive, the naive way would be to imagine that the, that the rites and forms of Christian worship correspond to some kind of quasi-material object in heaven, so that there is like a, you know, a, a heavenly version of the altar and the, and the, the hymn books and the and the pews and the nave and all the rest of it, that we should s sort of see the physical Christian church as a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence with, with literal archetypes for each of those items in heaven. I don't think that's the right way to see the relationship. Jesus says in John chapter 4 that the Father tr seeks true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? So the true worship and the, is, is mostly about what is happening in my interior life? St. Paul says that um, our spiritual act of worship is the offering of our bodies in living sacrifice. That This is really the essence of true worship. Now, the, the pattern of that self-offering is the self-offering of Jesus. So the archetype in heaven is not so much like, you know, a temple or an altar or an ambo, um, it's the person of Christ himself. And what is the essential in the act of Christian worship as understood by the Catholic faith? It's the person of Christ himself. Right? So the, the place where the continuity is greatest is, in fact, in the transubstantiation of the elements. Because the Christ who, who is ever living to make intercession with the church, you know, before the Father, the Christ who's at the Father's right hand in mm -hmm. heaven— mm -hmm is quite truly present with us in the Mass through transubstantiation. And his death, that thing that we are imitating, that thing that we are seeking to assimilate entirely into our personalities, is also manifested in a special way in the Mass um, uh, as the memorial of Christ's death on Calvary. Right? The double consecration of bread and wine memorializes what Jesus did on the cross. And so the victim who died at Calvary is really there with us. And the priest who was there offering at Calvary 
is really there with us in the person of Christ in the Mass. And so there is a profound continuity, but the continuity is in the person of Jesus himself and our response to him. Dennis, thanks so much uh, for your email. By the way, if you would like to send us an email for a future show, here's the address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. All right, Julia listening to us in Ohio on the great St. Gabriel Radio out of Columbus. Hey there, Julia, what's on your mind today? Hello. Um, on my mind is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking that when she was a little child, I'm wondering how much of the scriptures did they train her with because she seemed to be really um, into it when she was at the Annunciation. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know the extent to which Mary may or may not have been literate. Um, literacy was not widespread in that period of time and probably even less widespread among women compared to men. So mm -hmm. I don't know that it would be normal for girls to be taught to read in that, in that age, probably not. Of course, she was no normal girl. Um, but whatever her knowledge of letters, uh, she was deeply enmeshed in the story of the people of Israel. And uh, you know, her prayer in the Magnificat uh, absolutely situates her consciously within the great story of salvation history. And so the concepts, the images, the rites, the symbols, the feasts, everything that Scripture speaks to would have been deeply impressed upon her personality. Um, so, you know, a little thing like, you know, how do you spell, uh, you know, shibboleth in Hebrew, <laughs> you know, pales in comparison to, to the, the depth of her knowledge of biblical realities, right? Uh, but as to the question of her actual literacy, yeah, I have no idea. The very Magnificat itself is so sublime. Sublime. It's, it's just, beautiful. Just awesome. Julia, thank you so much for your call. Jay is watching us on YouTube today. Jay says, Catholics talk about charity and God. Just what is meant by charity? I have the feeling it's not just the standard definition, but it's hard to get a handle on. Thanks. And that's from oh, yeah, Jay. Sure. So the word charity just means love. Love. Just means love. Um, we use charity as opposed to love. Uh, we could say love. We could you just absolutely say love any place you say charity. One uh -huh. reason you might choose to say charity instead is because, in our culture, love sometimes is uh, uh, given a kind of banal sense that reduces it either to erotic attraction or to sentimentality, mm -hmm. right? And we need something much more powerful than that. So what we mean by love or charity in a theological context is the the willingness really to lay down your life on behalf of another person, right? To, to take the concerns of the other uh, as your own and to be willing to make extraordinary sacrifices on their behalf. That That's really, and Christ himself is the model for that. And, you know, most cultures love their own. And mm -hmm. Jesus talks about that. He talks about people who love pe members of their own family. What is unique about the Christian faith is that Christ calls us to love even our enemies in that way, to genuinely take their welfare to heart as our own concern and to be willing to lay down our lives on behalf of our enemies. Yeah. And that's kind of extraordinary. So that's that's really what we mean by Christian charity. Jay, thanks so much uh, for your call, your question uh, via YouTube today. Interesting question here now from Greg in New Haven, Connecticut. Can you please elaborate on the doctrine of the Trinity? First, using the word persons is confusing to me. Nowhere does it seem we should try to describe God the Father as a person, and the same for the Holy Spirit. Clearly, Jesus, the God-man, was subsumed into heaven as a person, body and soul. This seems to diminish that God the Father is almighty. It's also very confusing for the Holy Spirit to be separate from God and Jesus, as we often hear that the actions of the Spirit are directed by the Father or Jesus as a force, like the wind, uh, and not as a person who is independent of the Father and Son. Thank you, Greg from New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, thanks. I really appreciate the question profoundly. Uh, so the problem that you're having is that you are bring you're carrying a lot of freight into your concept of person and that's understandable that's the way we operate right so when you hear the word person you're forming a concept based on your interactions with human persons that you know and you're ascribing things like maybe a perspective in time and space and physical distance and and um, you know and a distinct mind and all these kinds of attributes that you would think of with your interaction with human persons 
And when we use the word person with reference to the Blessed Trinity, you have to abstract away from your definition of person everything except relation. Mm. Now, here's the difficulty with doing that. When we think of relation, we, we have all kinds of freight we bring in with the concept of relation, like I'm related to Tom professionally, socially, uh, physically, like we're, what are we, about three feet apart from one another. Like, they're all ki- you have to abstract all that away, and you're just left with the bare concept of relation itself, and then we use a very special terminology to describe the nature of the relation between father and son. We call it the relationship between father and son, <laughs> right? Yeah, or yeah. paternity and filiation, uh-huh. right? And and then you have to abstract away everything else that you would think about fathers and sons, like physical generation or playing Little League together or whatever it might be. All that gets taken away. So you're, you're left with a very abstract idea of pure relation and the relation of paternity to filiation. And the, the difficulty you run into is the difficulty we have any time we speak about God. Because any concept we apply to God is drawn from human experience and therefore is wholly inadequate to, 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 to capture the mystery of God's inner world, of God's essence. And so our language about God is uh, analogous at best. And, uh, you know, you can talk about language being univocal in the sense that if I use this word in this context, it means exactly the same thing in this other context, hmm. right? Analogous means, well, I can use the word in this one context, in the other context, it means something kind of similar, but a little bit different. And all our language of, about God is like that. We, we take concepts from human experience, we apply them to God, but only analogously. And the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215, said that when we predicate about God, when we talk about God, that yes, there are analogies between God and creatures, and we could use personhood as one of those analogous terms, but the disanalogies, the differences, the dissimilarities are infinitely greater. So whatever we say about God, there's a sense in which we're babbling, mm. because the mystery of God far exceeds anything that we could ever come to grasp conceptually. Um, and so the questions that you raise about the relationships within the Blessed Trinity all presume a kind of mundane understanding of persons and relations that really isn't applicable to the inner life of the Trinity. Okay. Appreciate that, Doug. Greg, thanks for checking in from New Haven. Interesting anonymous email that we received. I find myself reading my way toward the church. You can uh, relate to that, David. Reading myself uh, toward the church from Protestantism. Scripture alone no longer holds the place it once did for me. My question is... Been there, done that. You bet. I got the T-shirt, too. Uh, My question is, can you recommend a study Bible that has Catholic commentary like the ones I was used to in the NIV and others, but that were sometimes overtly anti-Catholic, those other books. I don't speak Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic, but I do like to stretch the intellect that God gave me. Any recommendations are welcome. And again, that's an anonymous emailer. I'm standing here right now, sitting here, holding in my hand the Catholic Scripture Study Revised Standard Version published by St. Benedict Press. Um, uh, And that is a good one. All right. You could also get, if you want something a little bit more robust, you could get the Word on Fire Bible from Bishop Barron's oh, yeah. ministry, and and uh, I think he's got one volume of that now out, maybe one and a half. Uh, the New Testament volume is out. Uh, he's got an Old Testament one coming out. I don't know if it's out or not. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that would be uh, quite edifying. And okay. then, yeah, so start there. A couple of great resources there for you. Thank you so much uh, for your email. Let's close with this one from Nancy. Dr. Anders, why did Jesus not know when the end of the world would come, saying that time is known only to Father. His humanity was at all times substantially united to his divinity, so how could Jesus not know? Right, so theologians give various answers to this question, but basically the humanity of Christ had no acquired knowledge, Mm. right? Meaning uh, the divine person, of course, knew everything, and Jesus is not a split personality, so he knows as a single person everything that there is to know as, a, as God. But we can still talk about the humanity of Christ learning. So there's a sense in which the zygote uh, held within the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary was omniscient. Uh-huh. And there's a sense in which it also had the acquired knowledge of a zygote, which is to say not very much. Yeah. You know, both of those things are true simultaneously. So... Jesus had to learn, for example, 
how to walk. Right, exactly. Things right. like that. Yeah, sure. All right, very good. And uh, Nancy, thanks so much for your email. Great way to close out the program. Dr. David Andrews, thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. We do this program Monday through Friday on the radio side of EWTN. Check it out at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. You can also check out the podcast anytime by going to EWTN.com slash radio. Uh, once you're there on the radio homepage, look for that little word podcast off to the right side of the page. Click on that and then look for a call to communion. This program, we uh, list those, by the way, alphabetically, real easy to find. Check out that podcast, EWTN.com slash radio. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on EWTN's Call to Communion. Have a wonderful day. God bless.